Thanks, Wayne. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm Jeremy Borelli. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit today, a little bit about uh, risk. And uh, we experience risk uh, and risk management uh, every day. And sort of how people react to those risks has an impact not only on our individual lives, but also has a, a power to collectively um, shape and influence larger cultural systems, such as the creation of a cultural landscape. So what I want, what I want, what I want to use is um, the notion of uh, cultural landscapes and uh, other theory grounded in, uh, developed by Anthony Giddens, to as a theoretical, theoretical backdrop to sort of explain how the cognitive uh, perceptions of and the behavioral responses to risk um, through risk management function to uh, actively shape and reconstruct the cultural landscape of uh, risk in Cape Town. And so what I'll, what I'll, my, present, my presentation today is going to use uh, three different case studies to sort of examine the development of the harbor in Cape Town um, and uh, examine those through uh, the perception of and management of risk. So the first of these case studies is the English East Indiaman fame, which uh, was uh, engaging in a trading route from uh, London to uh, Bengal, India. And it called into Table Bay in, on uh, May 25th. And uh, at midnight on uh, June 22nd, it, um, the vessel was uh, outbound to London and was uh, sailing around the, uh, southern, um, the southern entrance of the bay when uh, heavy winds, which are uh, very characteristic of uh, Cape Town and uh, th that area along the African coastline, uh, pushed the vessel uh, closer to shore. Um, there were no aids to navigation at that point, so, uh, and they were sailing at midnight, so they didn't realize that they were um, uh, close to the rocky shoreline, and the vessel uh, eventually grounded and became a total wreck in the wave activity close to Sea Point, um, which again is on the southern entrance of the bay. Uh, the contents of the vessel were uh, salvaged at the time of uh, wrecking and ex uh, salvaged extensively more by modern salvers uh, in, in the 1960s. And this vessel actually, on a side note, is a, a really interesting case study for the impact of salvage on uh, cultural heritage in South Africa that I can answer uh, more in uh, discussions later on. But uh, what this uh, wreck illustrates is that the high winds in the bay and the the, really the lack of navigational markers early in Cape Town's development um, made it uh, difficult for traditional sailing vessels to uh, successfully navigate through the surf um, and along the, the hazardous shoreline. So uh, in 1823, uh, a year later, um, uh, the Cape government decided to build a lighthouse uh, at Greenpoint and uh, an, an additional, uh, which is depicted here, and an, an additional uh, lighthouse was built later on in 1842, closer again to the entrance of the bay um, as this lighthouse was actually poorly placed as, and vessels still mistook the actual entrance of the shoreline. Um, and so uh, these, these uh, lighthouses guided uh, people away from uh, uh, the southern rocky entrance of the bay. But nav navigational aids weren't only man-made objects, they were also viewed into the landscape itself. Um, Cape Town is sort of known for its, these iconic mountains that border the inland side of the city. Um, there's three mountains. There's uh, the Lion Mountain, Table Mountain, and uh, what's called Devil's Peak. And specifically, uh, the Lion Mountain is named for its resemblance of a resting lion uh, with the lion's head, the lion's rump, uh, the tail, and then the north and south paws are actually two rock, uh, submerged rock formations which were depicted on early navigational charts um, uh, for mariners to, to avoid. And so this is a, a, a good example of um, uh, of people using uh, the, the landscape as a, as a tool for, for navigating, what they would actually do is they had a, a system of signals on top of Lion's Head and Lion's Rump, which is also conveniently called Signal Hill, um, that would uh, alert uh, people in uh, Cape Town to ships coming in from the south. They could be met by harbor officials and also to alert for any dangers that were coming in. Uh, and actually during the Dutch uh, period, uh, these signals were actually be used to uh, alert ships in the roadstead if the city had been taken by an enemy force uh, as well. So uh, 
when captains were entering the bay, they would also align uh, the line mountain with Table Mountain as a sort of way of determining where they were in the roadstead, which you can actually see on this map. Is, uh, it, show, it shows a depiction of where the actual anchoring ground was. So uh, the risks demonstrated by uh, the high velocity winds and the dangerous shoreline were sort of augmented by this looming threat of uh, tremendous storms that have historically devastated shipping in Table Bay. So these major storms were, were known to wreck entire fleets since the initial founding of Cape Town. Uh, the initial impetus for, for settling in Table Bay was actually a shipwreck um, caused by these winds and storms. Uh, in uh, 1822, 1846, and 1857, um, there were other major uh, uh, large-scale wrecking events, and, but none of these were, was as severe as the historic Great Gale in 1865. So the story of this is that after a relatively calm period and a dry spell, winds began to pick up overnight on uh, May 16th, 1865. Uh, by the morning of the 17th, the wind had caused the wave activity in the bay to increase so much that uh, uh, onlookers described it as the, the bay was just a sheet of foam. Uh, over the course of the next day and night, over uh, 37 small watercraft and 17 ocean-going vessels were either wrecked or stranded uh, on the shores of the bay. Uh, specifically, the RMS Athens, which was one of two, uh, one of the only two steamships lost in the bay, lost in the storm, uh, has a particularly um, uh, in interesting story. And uh, sort of a as it was sitting out in the harbor, um, it parted. It parted its cable, and the captain, Captain Smith, decided that he would try to uh, steam the vessel outside of the bay, get out of the wave activity, because the primary danger from these storms was that um, the vessels were going to get pushed up against the shore and, and stranded. So at 8 o'clock, he begins to steam out of the bay, and uh, we aren't sure what exactly happened, but uh, either the waves crashed over the deck and extinguished the en engine fires, or the vessel rolled in the heavy seas, but it eventually stranded close to the Mully Point Lighthouse, which is depicted here, and uh, uh, the newspapers at the time describe it as uh, the onlookers were looking on and they couldn't see the actual ship, but they could hear the screaming of the 21 passengers on board. The, the, by the morning, all that was left of this 200-foot uh, uh, steamship was its single-cylinder engine, well, which is uh, still sticking out of uh, the water close to uh, Mully Point right now. So these storms are a key component of the landscape of Risk and Table Bay. During, um, the, and these storms form by passing depressions, which consist of low pressure systems moving to higher latitudes during the winter months from April to September, um, where high velocity winds blow across the southern African coastline and uh, with particular ferocity at the Cape. Um, these uh, winds uh, during the winter months come from the northwest and create, and the currents in the bay create a uh, southerly flow. So I mentioned before that a lot of these vessels were stranded against the beaches. This is why, because the, the winds would um, actually push the vessels closer towards the bay, and then the currents would push them even right up against it and break them apart. And so what, what actually happened uh, in these storms is the bay actually formed an, a natural ship trap. And so uh, uh, so majority of the vessels that were wrecked were wrecked along these southern shores of the bay, the Woodstock Beach, the Salt River uh, entrance. Um, and also wave dynamics um, also created uh, certain areas of uh, uh, dangerous uh, wave activity at the rocky headlands of the bay up uh, in Blauberg and uh, Mully Point where uh, the wreck of the Athens and uh, this is a depiction of the uh, Thermopylae which wrecked in 1899. So the distribution of uh, types of vessels sort of sheds light further uh, on sort of these environmental patterns uh, and they indicate that sailing ships account for over 77 percent of the vessels wrecked in Table Bay. Uh, keep in mind that uh, historically we have, we know of about minimum 360 shipwrecks that have occurred in Table Bay alone. 
So 77% of those are, in fact, sailing vessels. The ratio of these vessels to engine-going uh, ships is about 8 to 1. So what this indicates is that engine-driven uh, engine vessels were better equipped to navigate and uh, get out of the harbor when, once the cables broke during these winter storms. Sailing ships were more susceptible to the high-velocity winds that were blowing, and, and again, were more susceptible to uh, grounding. And so what this implies is that uh, the majority of, that the reason why the majority of these vessels were lost was due, can be attributed to the natural conditions of the bay rather than human error or uh, action. Uh, what these storms also uh, uh, created in Cape Town was a cultural tradition of boating and boatmen um, that, took the, that took place. These boatmen were known and praised for their prowess at navigating through the surf and relaying cables and anchors to uh, vessels that uh, parted ways with theirs um, during these storms. There are um, numerous uh, uh, papers uh, depict these, you know, harrowing sort of stories of uh, the, these boatmen going out, you know, ships are running into each other and they're bringing cables. And there would actually be a much higher loss of life uh, attributed to these vessels if it weren't for these um, boatmen. And uh, in addition to their role uh, of sort of ad, as an ad hoc life-saving service, um, uh, these boatmen actually serve the, the needs of the harbor. Uh, due to the lack of uh, harbor facilities, these boatmen were used as a sole means of relaying cargo from ships to, uh, to shore or other landing places. Uh, because they were the only people really adept at navigating through the surf, and the use was ne necessary for conducting trading operations at the port, there were no fixed rates of hire. And they could uh, charge much, much higher wages than they could if they tried to find uh, work further inland. So what resulted from this sort of system was a, a, a group class of people whose livelihood uh, uh, on the waterfront began with Dutch rule at the Cape and continued through the con uh, construction of the harbor. Um, and here's a few images of, of these guys. Um, so, with the use of boatmen, and I, I ju like I just mentioned, there was a real lack of landing facilities for cargo uh, in Table Bay. When uh, Jan van Riebeck uh, originally settled um, uh, in Cape Town in uh, 1652, he created a uh, uh, wooden jetty for uh, uh, landing cargo people and, wa and providing water for ships uh, at anchor in the bay. But uh, this dilapidated wooden jetty lasted over almost 200 years uh, until they, uh, the British government decided to build a succession of dwarf jetties, um, which were continually inadequate for supplying the number of vessels passing by the Cape Good Hope. You have to keep in mind that uh, Cape Town is situated at a crossroads of trade between Europe and the eastern markets in Asia. So this was the sole route of passage to those markets until the opening of the Suez Canal. And so the number of ships passing by uh, Cape Town was significant. And these vessels, were, these uh, harbor works were just not equipped to deal with that. And the only way of relaying people and cargo was through these boatmen. It wasn't until uh, 1860 with the construction of an inner and outer basin that they began to uh, uh, allow for a uh, for larger ships and uh, a more efficient transfer of people and cargo. But uh, again, this was a chronic condition uh, in Cape Town. And so uh, the wreck this brings me to the next uh, case study, which is the wrecking of the SS Hermes. Um, so the, the problem with the inadequacy of the harbor facilities is highlighted with this uh, the second of the uh, onset of the Anglo-Boer War in 1899. Um, the docks were continually inundated with vessels, and the war uh, in the interior caused an influx of shipping from uh, London and uh, other areas in the British Empire, and uh, caused the anchorage to actually be stacked up. There were actually three vessels stacked up uh, in a single key. And you can see the congestion just in the roadstead right here. And so the, the Hermes was bringing in fodder to supply horses for the war. And uh, 
from Argentina, and when it came, the again, the harbor was full. There, were, there was a, a real lack of um, uh, space for it to come in, so what it did was it anchored out in the roadstead. Lo and behold, that night, a storm, uh, a storm came up, and uh, due to negligence on the part of the uh, ship's first mate, who uh, la failed to notify the captain until the vessel was too close to shore, um, the vessel actually grounded uh, over near uh, Milnerton and uh, became a, a total wreck. So, uh, the gr so the growing demand for space in the harbor and the inability to eff efficiently transfer cargo and people and boats in and out of the harbor caused the risks in the bay to increase even though adequate protection was afforded after the construction of a breakwater in uh, 1870. So there are mainly three themes of uh, risk, or risk, risk management that can be gleaned from the development of the harbor uh, and represented by these three case studies. This, these are the, the protection of shipping, promotion swell, and uninterrupted communication for shore, uh, and the means of landing and shipping goods at all time without the intervention of these costly boats. And, uh, when, and lastly, an independent shelter. Uh, the protection for shipping also serves to sort of uh, account for that uh, third uh, theme as well. But the Cape landscape of risk is really characterized by this dialectical relationship between the notion of Cape Town as this Cape of Storms and the, Cape and the moniker given to it by Portuguese King John II as the Cape of Good Hope. So the breakwater constructed in Table Bay uh, created a, an area for refu of refuge that sort of mitigated for this bay, this bay of storms. That uh, it, it allowed the necessary protection and decreased the number of wrecking events in the bay significantly. For businessmen and uh, travelers to the Cape, the perspective engaging, uh, in engaging with trade with the East and utilizing the Cape itself uh, and visiting the Cape reduce the perception of risk uh, and the potential gain or benefit uh, made this level of acceptable risk more manageable. And as you can see, the construction of the breakwater actually served to um, create a really uh, low point of wave dynamics in the bay. You can see the, um, uh, through this chart here. Uh, as the harbor received an increasing number of vessels uh, of even larger size. This top graph uh, shows the number of the total tons of uh, vessels entering the bay in 1822. Compared to 1910, you can see there's an exponential increase in the number of vessels coming to the Cape. So the, the real lack of um, uh, ad adequate space, adequate uh, harbor facilities required consistent expansion of, uh, of the harbor, of its operations. And even after the construction of the Suez Canal, uh, this, the, this, which would have diverted a lot of this traffic away from the Cape, the discovery of gold and diamonds uh, in the interior uh, caused an uh, even greater influx of um, travelers, fortune hunters, and uh, uh, businessmen uh, to the Cape, which only uh, perpetuated this uh, uh, system. Uh, and so what resulted from uh, this, expand this system of expanding the harbor was uh, a culture of accommodation for a myriad of cultures which resulted in Cape Town's uh, sort of symbolic role as the tavern of the seas, the halfway house, and the halfway house to the east. Um, and so that tradition continues today with the uh, uh, expansion of the Victorian Alfred waterfront which is a, a major tourist attraction for uh, visitors and uh, passengers uh, in Cape Town. Uh, and so, uh, in conclusion, uh, I'd like to uh, say the, the looking at the culture of risk uh, and by examining risk and risk management, it provides a, an effective outlet for examining uh, broad-scale patterns sort of in harbor development uh, 
by using a cultural landscape approach. And uh, yeah, I'd like to thank everyone for coming out. And uh, uh, that's it. Uh, I'd like to thank Iseco Museums for helping out with this research, and Sara and uh, Lynn and everyone. Thank you. Thank you.